Um, I'm not going to say in the cold weather because, you know, it's not that cold. You didn't suffer or sacrifice. First of all, <laughs> first of all, silence your cell phones, please. All right. So um, we are here tonight because the Menkiti family bought this bookstore. How, how long ago was it? About 15 years ago? 2006. 2006. And uh, after Ifani, Ifani Menkiti died, his wife, Carol Menkiti, and their family have kept this place going wonderfully. And it's a great, terrific resource for not just the Boston area community, but all of New England and really all of the country. So, and I, I want to actually uh, make a special tribute to James Fraser, who is the manager of the store and has breathed this incredible spirit of friendliness and um, accessibility into this place, which I will say, quite frankly, didn't always feel that way. Now, um, I, I'm, I'm going to make what will seem like an absurd comparison, but uh, it's sincere. So the Cuban revolutionary Che Guevara once said, forgive me if I seem ridiculous, but the true revolutionary is motivated by feelings of love. And I would say, making a comparison with James, not between James and Che, but on the, on the idea of uh, that a, a truly great bookseller is motivated by feelings of love. I think James has in, imbued this store and this whole experience with not only his love of books, and of poets, but of poetry and literature in general. And I just want to thank him for what he's done. All right, so I'm going to introduce the three poets, and I'm not going to do anything biographical about them, except I will make one exception, which is I will say about April, who's not the first. She is the first poet. I <laughs> anyway, I'll say before I do my introduction that I have my first book was published after April edited it, April has a service in which she, she edits books and she did an absolutely brilliant job of ordering the poems so that they talk to each other in a really fantastic way. And she also got me published. And this is how. I, I had been rejected 62 times by submitting to contests. And she said, Tom, about a year after she had worked with me, she said, Tom, do you want to win a prestigious prize or do you just want to get published? I said, I just want to get published. So she sent me a list of 10 places that have open readings that aren't competitions. And the second one I sent to took it. So thank you, April, for that. <laughs> All right. So the three poets tonight, April Osman, Matthew Henry, and Dale Cottingham. And I'm going to introduce them individually. So first up is April. In the poetry of April Osman, the hortatory voice takes precedence over the imperative voice. Her poetry, brimming with a consciousness of suffering, with a moral conscience, exhorts rather than demands. If there are, quote, fearful corridors, unquote, where lonely ghosts might lodge, a hot wish might banish these things, quote, let every such corridor be buried in everlasting snows and forgotten or opened into fields any flowers or passers-by may occupy." Unquote. Against the cruelty of ownership, the poet's voice proposes a world in which gentleness is the landlord. Quote, let no land, no thing, and no one be owned. Let possession be ten tenths of the law, but let the law, but let the only law be kindness. Unquote. Even so, against the clashing symbol of political invective, against the type who, quote, made love to his own polemic, unquote, against exhortation itself, a character in her poem, Knee Deep, chooses a quiet contemplation that lights, quote, a lone flashlight in a mansion, the lack of power made dark, unquote. And in, against a sense of divinity emanating from a world outside of us, Osman finds a non-hierarchical divine in the quotidian. Her world is populated by 
and I'll end on four lines from one of her poems. Each luminous, breakable neighbor, sipping hot coffee or eating a donut, holy in the moments, duty will soon co-opt, but none more or less divine than any other. April Osman. A little crowded. All right. Hmm. Okay, if you can hear me in the back, raise your hands. All right, good. So um, I want to thank James and Bookstore for having us and all of you for coming out. And I especially would like to thank Tom, not just for that wonderful introduction, but um, Tom, besides being a lovely poet, is one of the most generous people I have ever met. <laughs> so if it weren't for Tom, this reading, we wouldn't be reading here tonight either. Um, so thank you. So. I'm going to read first um, the poems that Tom was quoting from are all from my forthcoming book, which is We, and uh, Red Hen Press is going to be publishing that just about a year from now. Um, so the poems um, in this book are all an effort to bridge the divides that we're all feeling here politically and reach across and find some kind of way to have some sort of healing and unity and maybe not civil war. <laughs> um, First poem is called Nonpartisan. If I told you I saw your soul, would you judge me inappropriate or disbelieve me? If you asked for a description, would I admit you glowed golden as these late northern afternoons whose slanted autumn light makes green fire of a backlit tree's shimmering leaves? and balances me perfectly on the tightrope between yearning and content as if I finally understood what beauty meant to tell me. Mm -hmm. uh, this next poem deals with bumblebees, among other things, it's called Shift. Though I know I'm supposed to applaud all pollinators, including wasps invading my space, Dive bombing outdoor meals, nesting in eaves, hovering in constant proximity. I don't. If my prejudice makes exception for honeys and my garden's most prolific bees, for their fuzzy bobbing and weaving, their bumbling against delicate petals, which does no harm, their lolling in summer breeze, these gentle teddy bears of bees, these yogis of everything stinging, will that begin to shift in ism in me? Uh, this next one is one that Tom mentioned. It's called Knee Deep. And um, I wrote this when I used to watch news clips of Trump rallies. I would always focus on the people behind him. It's like, who are these people? <laughs> and there was this one man at, 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 in a news clip that was different from all the other people in the audience, and so I wrote the poem to try to figure out why. So knee deep. Among the raucous ralliers sat a man more still than rest, a heron waiting knee deep and lake among marauding gulls, as the Narcissus who would be king made love to his own polemic, the people reflected like white water. The placid man did not react on cue, not cheering with his fellows, not laughing, not waving a sign, perhaps listening intently to the speaker, but more likely to some inner piper inviting wandering, not shouting in that, sorry, not shouting agreement or invective as they all were exhorted, not praising his invisible clothes as the would-be emperor spoke of all they should fear and loathe. The man's face wore an expression of hope that shone like a lone flashlight in a mansion the lack of power made dark. 
Uh, this next one, um, I took a, a stab at rewriting the preamble to the Constitution. So <laughs> this is what I think it should sound like now. <laughs> 21st century preamble. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union than chocolate and coffee or hot dogs and baseball, of liberty and justice for all, for donkeys, elephants, and cats who walk by themselves, but depend equally on common love and compassion. We establish equality to ensure domestic tranquility, even for the braying, trumpeting, yowling, fat cats, politicians, pundits, masses, and middle class with whom still others may disagree. We do provide for the common defense, which is not synonymous with offense or preemption, to promote the common welfare of every human being and secure the blessings of health, education, and wealth without prejudice to all, to ensure posterity measured by the golden rule, polished to its highest gloss. We do ordain and establish in common sense, honoring our common divinity, in the United States of America and globally, a model and beacon of hope beckoning to the oppressed everywhere. We enshrine this constitution, this covenant of cooperation in civility, independence and interdependence, the preservation of which will make America great again. <laughs> Uh, this next one is a definition poem, um, and it's skinny on the page because the word is corridors. So it's a bunch of different definitions of corridors with which I took some liberties. A shared office space might employ one for privacy or primacy, as might a prison. A house with many rooms might require one for ingress, unless it were open concept cathedral ceilinged communal space to prepare for grace with faith in some return for coming and going in blessedness. Another kind might run rings around a fear that built a fortress. Another might allow other countries or landowners narrow access. But in this quantum present, let us agree. No more barbed wire still retaining trace DNA though no flesh or blood remains in sight. No more fortified trenches filled with soldiers. No more corridors of war. No fearful corridors of any sort for lonely ghosts to float. Let them go into the great unknown. Let every such corridor be buried in everlasting snows and forgotten, or opened into fields any flowers or passers-by may occupy. Let no land no thing and no one be owned. Let possession be ten-tenths of the law, but let the only law be kindness. Um, and this next one, which Tom also referred to, um, this, this one I wrote was around the time of the first Trump State of the Union address. And I happened to be driving in the dark just before dawn along this country road. And like the people that were up, you know, it was really kind of magical. They put the lights on. And so that's how this happened. But State of the Union, Obad. Moving through dawn's ethereal twilight gray as darkness leeches from valley landscape. Passing gold lit rooms like staged plays, wombs from which a day's labor is born. Brief havens for waking, one man with his back to me, though he doesn't know it, bent like a lover to his task, with faith in walls that may not be all he needs to survive catastrophe. One man with his hand cupped so tenderly around a mug, I want to hug him. Maybe contemplating ways to face the day with faith in compassion and adversity. Each luminous, breakable neighbor sipping hot coffee or eating a donut, wholly in the moments, duty soon will co-opt, but none more or less divine than any other. Um, and I'm gonna read a couple of poems 
um, from each of my two books, which are actually here in person. Uh, they're both from four-way books. First one's uh, Anxious Music, and the second one is Event Boundaries. So uh, I think I'll go backwards in time and read two short ones from each. So this first this first poem I'm going to read is um, it's a long distance love poem and it's kind of cranky as, as you'll see. <laughs> when your people call my people to arrange a meeting, know that lately I am giving myself to sleep as I once gave myself in love. My body flung eagerly into bed, limbs limp and heavy with pleasure. The bedclothes on waking arranged exactly as I entered them. I am in love now with rest, with release from the tireless ego. Let us meet while we sleep, which seems lately to be less a rehearsal for death than a preview of immortality and see what our souls see, where we are, our inward selves only, and all ourselves are not at war when all our loyalty belongs to dreaming. Uh, this next poem um, has um, heliotropism, you know, when plants keep moving toward the light, right? so reach. The cut tulips bloom too soon to last as long as I will them to. If another's will could keep one tulip, brother or parent alive, what altered world would we inhabit? The tulips' mortal wounds don't prevent their curving and recurving each time I shift them in their vase, seeking for reasons I don't understand, a more perfect symmetry. The sun rises before I do, and the tulips, as if light could save them, have with their dying reach arced again beyond my will for them, sideways as far as their dismembered stems allow into its animating grace by the time I wake. Ah, uh, other love poem, not so cranky. Whose fragile lips. I feel you're watching while I wash dishes, gratitude, admiration, or regret. First the glasses whose fragile lips I trace with a lover's hands, glass too thin at the rims, bottoms too round not to slip my soapy grasp, though I keep thinking I'll invent a better grip. Do I press too hard or is the glass too frail? I cannot hold it gently enough. Under my strength, I see it breaking like before, opening and reopening the white crescent moon of my early injury. There's seven stitches in a body's life of injuries, but I remember every time I ease my hand into the zopi glass, grateful for each reprieve. It's not the severity, but the nature of the injury, skin so thin there, bones so near, the idea that I do this to myself. How shall I seek to embrace my weakness? Now I know everything I will ever believe about strength or love is wrong. Uh, I don't know how many of you might be flower gardeners, but I'm a flower gardener and this is about that struggle. The name of the mold. Every spring, there's a moment before blight, before mildew on flocks, or the lattice work left by appetite on viburnum and lilac and rose, before the creeping yellow slime mold appears suddenly after rain on the pine mulch and puffs itself up and attacks the foxglove, then dries and flattens and browns as if it never meant to eat mane. There's a moment when all the leaves are shiny and green without blemish. When I think a benevolent God will grant me one summer without affliction. Am I fallen because I failed the garden? Or does the garden fail because I'm fallen? Or is it a great temerity in me to think I have anything at all to do with it? We've eaten the apple. And the first thing we think we know is whose fault it is. And, uh, Last one um, is sure. I have a reputation for being sure-minded. 
It's what I tell myself I am. Something I somehow misunderstood is a virtue, a mantra I've used for comfort. I've been called numb as a pounded thumb, but never unsure. Sure, I know what I want. Sure-footed, sure-handed. Sure, the first time he placed his finger in the V of my satin green pajamas and asked to see my tan line. Sure, the last time when he murmured, I remember these. Two breakups and reconciliations have taken the edge off my surety, and I've begun to be a doubter. Is a sideways glance he's sliding me plot or invitation? Just how worthy is this canoe? How wet is the water? In which direction shall we paddle? I'm not sure what the dusty green of this pond, warm as pea this summer, covers. I'd guess the bottom's muddy and riddled with water weeds, but the depth, I suspect, is shallow. Are you sure you want to know, he says? Sure, I say, is what I've built my life on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, April. <clears throat> uh, just a reminder that this is a bookstore, which is in the business of selling books. So I hope that you will all leave with at least one book, if not all books from all three, at least one reader tonight. Thank you, April. That was quite wonderful. Wonderful to hear you read. Is this it's working? Can you guys hear it's me hard, okay? But it's kind of low. It's kind of low. Is that better? Okay, all right. So remember to speak into this. So the next reader is Matthew Henry, and um, I just want to thank a poet and impresario of poetry, a, a poetry citizen, as we call them. That's somebody who who does things on behalf of other poets instead of just themselves. Named Gloria Monahan, who re leads a, a wonderful series in Weymouth called uh, the Open Door series. It's the, at the Open Door yoga studio, which has the most hideous seating imaginable. Um, so bring your own lawn chair if you go, but it's where I first heard Matthew Henry read. In the poetry of Matthew Henry, outrage accelerates through the piston push of wit and irony. As the poet maneuvers through the world of witless racists, the quote, vocal static the hems and haws of white noise, unquote, as his, quote, inward rolling eyes, unquote, assess, they come to this conclusion. Sometimes the only answer can be, quote, showing you a blank page and a pen filled with blood, unquote. You guys want to get seats? Everybody okay? As a school teacher with a job description that, quote, doomed me to be more didactic, unquote, Matthew Henry must convert indignation into analogy. But this in no way diminishes the impact of his poems. Measurements in Henry's poetry are grim, as in the time span limits in the occupational hazard of being young and black. A call to 911 prompts this comparison. Quote, I tell the dispatcher 14 times, once for each year they could lose, like loose cigarettes or Skittles, if wearing a hood, holding a wallet or phone, unquote. The poet ventilates what the civil servant cannot. In response to the idiocy of his fellow school system, system employees who are concerned about offending the sensibilities of those who do not want to hear that the world is a racist hellhole, the poet gives much better than he gets. I hope hand soap lights your face on fire and the only available suppressant is a dull fork. <laughs> I hope termites lay 
oblong eggs in your pubic hair and hone their taste for unwashed flesh. I give you Matthew. <laughs> Yeah, Hello, everyone. Hi. Everyone can hear me in the back. I'll do the teacher thing and project. Is this better? All right, cool. Um, like, thank you very much for that introduction. It was wonderful. Thank you, James. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm gonna read first from the third enunciation. Uh, it's my latest, my latest full-length collection. Um, I wasn't going to read from this, and then today was just interesting uh, at work. Uh, ended up in a doing an independent study with one of my students who is uh, doing philosophy, and so we ended up having a lot of conversations about the nature of uh, God and the numinous or the lack thereof. Uh, this collection, the Third Enunciation, is a collection of theological sonnets. Um, I'll just let them speak for themselves. Maybe Jesus didn't eat his spinach. <laughs> Michael thought the sermon went rather well, how he without sin should cast the first stone. Later, Bible closed, he wondered. After carving their sins into a gasping ground, what would Jesus do? Had they grabbed her arms and righteous rocks crying out for justice? Remain a passive bystander, kneeling as crushed skull flecks onto his face? Or call legions of angels to halt the horror? Considering all he's counseled that God has allowed, words of comfort built upon some mystery good all things work toward, his most honest theology scares him. For those who have any background in the church, um, a lot of this in this collection uh, uses passages from the Christian New Testament and from the Hebrew Bible and asks questions about them. Uh, other poems are from my experiences with you know, friends, family, um, and students who are family. Uh, I can do those out crying. Ooh, that was, that happened. Uh, this poem is based off of a conversation I had with one of my former students uh, years ago. All of the sonnets except the maybe sonnets start with the word say. Uh, trigger warning for suicidal ideation. Say, she solely persists by the belief that suicide is sin. It's all that's keeping red pills at bay. Here, sound theology sows truth in an unworn jacket, fragment fresh and velvet lining while the house burns and ties a millstone around her barely bobbing neck. Who would correct her? Tell her a thrice-loving God allows, sustains, and will not banish the pain she could strangle with the bedsheets she sweat soaks each night, or her new license in an old oak. Better to smile and swallow whatever lies keep wrist skin bound, keeps blood from tinting the grout of her bathroom's marble and honest red. I personally don't believe that um, a higher power of any kind would send someone to a, a negative afterlife if they were to commit suicide. But I wasn't going to say that to my kid um, because my job is to, you know, keep them alive. Um, I'll only read two more from this collection. Uh, context of this poem. So I, uh, my first collection is called Teaching While Black because um, I forgot to mention that I'm black. Hi, this is not just a really good tan. Um, when I read the other poem, some people feel like, oh, Oh, he can say those words. Um, and so I was doing an interview, and some the person uh, I met, uh, they asked they asked me this interesting question. They're like, "You have a lot of poems that are about race and education. We have these poems over here about theology and philosophy. Do you ever do both of those together?" And I was like, "Get off my back! Like, what do you want from me? I don't need the emotional labor of doing that." And it ended up with poems where I ended up doing that. Uh, here's one of them. Say. We survey the wondrous cross burning outside the hanging man's home. One dying because the whole realm of nature could not hold those who don't know their place, who would be called a man. 
C. From his head, his hands, his feet. Blood flowing down like the love his children lost the moment he gloried in lifting his eyes from dirt. See his rope ascension. See the crowd composed, bodies thick as thorns. See contempt poured. The laughter, the pointers, the vile boasters proudly raising their charred tokens, an ear, a lip, a testicle. See how they silenced his skin, demanded, his life is all. See his divinity. And since I'm told that I can't read from this question without ending with something that's a happier poem, um, <laughs> I, I credit the people who read through this, uh, the manuscript originally, because I had sort of, it's five sections, kind of had four and a little bit in the fifth, and they were like, can you end with something that has like hope in it? Because these are crushing our spirit. And I was like, have you met me? So um, I'll read a poem about sex because, yeah. <laughs> my book launch was fun when my parents walked in, and I was like, ah, well, I'm doing this now. <laughs> Say prayer is sex with God, biblically, knowing the divine in bedrooms, mid-sized cars, with backs arched over kitchen tables, knees bent, eyes closed, fingers entwined or clasped, often without saying, needing a word. With a sweet release of oxytocin and essence, desires meld like bodies, two wills become lost in one. A little death sought in the asking, receiving what the Holy Spirit craves without ceasing, the soul-shaking, toe-curling pleasure. Night, noon, and morning, our flesh is willing. This blessed communion, which leaves us gasping, amen, again, and again, and again. <laughs> Changing gears abruptly. Um, so, I'm Black. Hello, welcome. Uh, I'm also an educator. Uh, I teach, I have no chill. So I teach in Weston, public schools. Um, I said that and immediately some of you were like, oh, oh what's that like? It's interesting at times. Um, but I have been black my entire life and I've been often as one of my students uh, told said, uh, been a raisin in a bowl of milk. Been the only black or brown face in a classroom. I was an Echo student for those who know Mecco and Wellesley and now I teach in Weston. You can, it explains so much, yes. Um, and so this collection is a semi-autobiographical journey of me from being, you know, little black brown kid in class through now being bigger black brown kid um, on the other side of the desk. So I'll read a few student-centered poems and then a few me as teacher poems. Self-evident. I'll do this one without an accent. As a kid from Boston, the Revolutionary War was my favorite subject in fourth grade. A tea party I could respect, Class trips vainly searching for musket balls in Lexington treetops. Reading of decapitation by cannonball on Breed's Hill. Even the sites in Southby, unsafe for me to visit, were a source of tribal pride, like rooting for the patriots. We were told to don our colonial imagination caps and tell our story of emancipation from the British. Where would we be? The Old South Meeting House? The Old North Church? What would we see as we rose to American greatness? Our teacher should hear freedom ringing in the streets through our words. I dropped my head to begin, oversized pencil in hand, until I remembered. Seeing my inaction, she crouched and began to re-explain. I patiently waited for her to finish, eyes on her lips, and then asked if she wanted me to pretend to be white, or to picture myself for sale on the steps of Faneuil Hall or stacked in one half of the harbor ships heading to and from the West Indies, explaining my parents' patois. After the vocal static, the hems and haws of white noise, she suggested, Christmas Addicts, the hometown boy, the black hero of the Boston Massacre. My siblings had taught me the one drop rule and when to nod my head politely. So I pretended he was not half Wampanoag, that Framingham was not his master's home and imagined myself the first unarmed black man shot on these urban streets. I was a joy at the school. <laughs> I always have to preface folk this poem by saying, yeah, this happened. 12 minutes a slave. 
We held a slave auction in class today. Probably not a state sanctioned component of AP US history, but Mr. S made a block out of the front row desks, cornered it off with backwards facing chairs. He shameful forced Tony Miller above us, introduced them as item number five. He prepared a catalog, a one-sided sepia sheet with a starting price and Tony's description. Before the bidding, Mr. S made Tony turn in perfect circles so we could all see what we were getting. Made him show his gums and teeth, roll up his sleeves and flex, lift an Oxford on a bridge over his head and strain for as long as he could. We were encouraged to holler, not yell, intrusive questions about Tony's pedigree and prior owners, to discuss if he was better suited for house or field, to speculate about breeding options. After Tony climbed down, unable to meet our eyes or the oppressive silence, I was almost ashamed that a white teacher treating one of his own like this made my brown skin rattle with the joy of falling chains. The teachers in the room know tenure just is an amazing thing. Uh, reading a few teacher poems, uh, I became a teacher because I, I, you know, I love the respect that we get from the communities in which we work. Um, that was sarcasm. I, I am actually a teacher because I love my kids. Is one of my former students is here. I'm so embarrassed. Yeah. Um, and also just because I need, uh, so the cover art for this, one of my former students made, Jackie Lou, look her up. She's making a heck of a lot more money than I am doing art and I'm so proud of her. Um, an open letter to the secretary who asked how I haven't taken to drink or schedule one narcotics like so many of our colleagues. My inward rolling eyes consider the 26 administrators in seven years, including the principal who put a pregnant woman in a headlock, who said, I gave the Hispanics a soccer ball. What more do they want? Another arrested for battering his wife. The week it took IT to realize our new email said, pubic school. <laughs> the budget cuts and bomb threats, fire drills, tornado drills, chemical spill drills, the porn accident in physics class, the students discussing which of us would take a bullet with their names on it, later seen in handcuffs, cages, caskets, the cancers and car crashes, the substitute who dropped her panties and shat on the wheelchair ramp inside the library, the teacher caught shirtless with a 14 year old in her car, the sleepless nights holding secrets like hands after abortions, miscarriages, and becoming a godfather. I don't know how to answer, save showing you a blank page and a pen filled with blood. I feel required so I can keep my job to say this. That wasn't in Weston, that was somewhere else. I get away with a lot. They'd be like, how dare you? Um, this poem, on the other hand, was Weston. Um, when asked why all lives don't matter, After a deep breath, I attempted to explain. My aunt had breast cancer. Despite a healthy dose of science and scripture, prayer and prescriptions, the shadow never dimmed. We celebrated her life, mourned the hole her grave dug in ours. Why this disease would claim a wife, a coworker, a friend, an aunt. At the repast, heads turned to the future saving other sons and daughters ourselves. A collection was ta taken to fund breast cancer research, um, a sc medical scholarship for oncology study discussed, a proposal for new. From the back of the church hall, a woman no one recognized screamed, what about prostate cancer and ovarian cancer? Why aren't you talking about those? All cancers matter. Most of my students nodded into the ensuing silence. But some blank stares and my job description doomed me to be more didactic, to explain appropriate time, place, and manner, intent versus impact, the guilt and shame required to derail communal grief and hijack a narrative to make oneself more comfortable. I explained the human duty to choose. Enter the room willing to bear bodies on your shoulders or leave and silently stand outside. I said, replace cancer 
with lives and waited. I always wait after that one because I, I may or may not have been at a, a large Christian college in the South and I read that poem and two women got up and started walking out. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. And they're like, oh, no, no, we have class right now. It's nine o'clock at night, you're lying. But it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll read two more poems and I will be out of your hair. Um, I can generally get through this one without crying. All right, let's see what happens. Uh, it takes its title from a James Baldwin essay, A Report from Occupied Territory. A confession from occupied territory. After the frantic emails, a cry for help in the middle of a night one student feared another would not survive. I called the police, resisting the screaming of my skin. After weighing the sharp, bloody consequences of inaction, the cost of action crushed my chest. I couldn't breathe, for they are black and they are they, not him, not her. I tell the dispatcher 14 times, once for each year they could lose like loose cigarettes or Skittles if wearing a hood or holding a wallet or a phone. And they have a history of mental illness. So officers see knife, gun, in every open hand. At least they live in a nice neighborhood. Single family homes on red lined land, a world where sergeants conduct wellness checks with smiles broad as arms, away from holsters. They'll even offer to remove their boots lest they sully the foyer's imported carpet. All this is small solace in the silence following. Thank you for your call. We'll send someone right over. Both kids are fine. They are like in their 20s and adults, but um, I, I can't not talk about this without. Yeah. Uh, literally in the news the weeks beforehand, it was Young black kids being killed by the police. And it was young um, people who don't fit the gender binary narrative being killed by the police. And people with mental health illnesses being killed by the police. And my kids all three. And when I call the school, they're like, oh, why don't you just call the police and handle it yourself? And I'm like, oh, I'm oh, one last poem. Um, an open letter to the public school employees worried that anti-racist is too controversial a term. In my defense, I didn't know who this poem was about when I wrote it. I was just told that someone made this statement in a meeting and I wrote a poem. I later found out that they were at my book launch and were highly offended. <laughs> and before I read the poem, I said, if you're in the audience and this poem is about you, I don't know this is about you, but I'm sorry, you should be a better human being. For some reason, they were offended. An open letter to the public school employees <laughs> worried that anti-racist is too controversial a term. Some days I believe the number of first cousins holding hands in a marital bed is dwindling. An illusion upended when you speak. I hope hand soap lights your face on fire and the only available suppressant is a dull fork. I hope termites lay oblong eggs in your pubic hair and hone their tastes for unwashed flesh. I hope your children choose your elder care options from an old 60 Minutes expose <laughs> and find your savings the perfect seed money for investing in underwater solar panels. I hope happiness is a football that your Charlie Brown in time is Lucy. I hope your cat leaves, your kite strings always break, and ravens remember your eyes. I hope you'll understand how you sound. I hope you'll realize this poem is an acrostic. A noose waiting to tilt your neck and act accordingly. Um, I guess I'll read the letters. Um, um, S H U T T H E F U C A U P. Thank you. I, I think there are some people out in uh, the listening land who will feel that I hope your cat leaves is the worst insult <laughs> you could ever lay on somebody. Um, I, I, having a prurient imagination, I, I kind of want to know what that porn accident in physics class was, but I, maybe that's not for prime time. Um, but I also want to say, Matthew, that after hearing your sonnet about having sex with God, I want to 
somehow revive St. Teresa da Villa and John Dunn and tell them, eat your heart out. <laughs> anyway, that was wonderful. Thank you. All right. Against the illogic of existence, Dale Cottingham is no smug explainer. He proffers questions, not answers. Quote, what did it matter if I stumbled with weed sling in hand? Doesn't the earth demand earthiness, earthliness, prayers offered by tarnished hands? Unquote. Strange occurrences are not classified as mystifiers, but rather as an opportunity to go about the work of, quote, inventing the strangeness of the other in our eyes. Unquote. Arresting metaphors frame the portal into a world beyond our mortal ken. For example, quote, wheat like tiny hands reaching skyward, unquote. Or a cotton shift which brightens, quote, white, breezy as our conversation, unquote. And yet the poetry manages to ground us on this earth as the struggles against the vicissitudes of existence which land a man, quote, hunched over the kitchen table, figuring the fuel bill next month's groceries, gripping the pencil nub in the small circle of light where he worked. I give you Dale Cottingham. Well, I want to say thank you, James. Thank you, April, Matthew, Tom. I want to say thank you very much for that introduction. I need to speak a little louder. I am a lawyer by day, but on the margins of the day, I'm a poet. And um, I appreciate very much the opportunity to be here at Grolier's, and I'm glad each of you are here. Uh, so my volume, I'm glad we're in a bookstore. I like the idea of plugging and selling books. I like that very much, apparently surrounded by books. So I'm going to read a, a few of the poems from the book. Um, I do gravitate toward the word earthy and earthly. Um, so, Pond Gone Dry. Beyond the roadside fence, some ranchers pushed up an earthen embankment for a pond gone dry. Maybe the snow melt and rain runoff are too meager to fill it. Or maybe the, the damn soil is too porous, too poor to hold what it receives. Maybe the rains haven't come right for too long, exposing tangled weeds and silt. It's like this on these plains. Some ideas thrown up in hope over time that failed to take. Now this poem is about my parents. I did have parents. They were wonderful to me. Um, and it's because of my mother, frankly, that um, I've gravitated toward uh, literature. I was telling Tom before the reading that uh, my inspiration initially was T.S. Eliot. But the poet that really got my attention was William Matthews, his uh, book, Sleep for the Long Flight and uh, Time and Money. So at any rate, those, let me up like that. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll just share that with you. Okay. Uh, the poem about my parents, Two Trees. Harbored from north winds by the barn, two trees grew together, close as lovers. 
Decades wore their wove their limbs, so one's branch the others one's uh, branch bore the other's leaves. Till a hard freeze reached the heartwood, rendering the roots useless. Come spring, one tree bore luminous green, pungent leaves breathing April's warmer air, while the other stayed lifeless gray as if one died in the arms of the other. I almost cry. So, growing up on a farm on the plains, we built a pole barn. This poem is about the pole barn. The pole barn burned down. So that's what invoked this poem. Pole barn. In it, we stored what was useful or what we couldn't bear to let go of altogether, settling by letting go as far as the barn. Willed into place, shake or simple, three rows of three great poles, girth wide as a man, shouldered up and set down in hand dug holes. And they were hand dug holes. Corrugated steel panels for walls and for roof nailed in with rib nails, two by four serving as joists, rising like a dream all summer. A sanctum where I'd lingered, inhaling its smell of dirty dry floor, of, of dry dirt floor and solvent, dust suspended in darkened air to fetch an owl. Or, uh, or axe, or whatever I was sent for, until it was taken by fire. The flames overwhelming our hold, our hose, and spreading over the structure, volumes of black smoke rising. A harvest of what fomented when I'd sit watching hang across the road, the machine's intake, the right square bales gone to heat, weeds, stubble, dust. Now this poem is for Jim. I read this the other night. So shout out for Jim again. I asked the other night if anyone had been west of Alva, Oklahoma. I got the answer California, but not that far away. The title of this poem is West of Alva, Oklahoma. Further on, the land opens up to grassy plains. No mountains or trees, no dramatic precipice edging hairpin curves, only this monotonous, unremarkable flat expanse, like a man who's given up every pretense he used to own. Now, this is one of the ones that uh, Tom read, or at least a portion of it, when I like. I like them all, but at any rate. Um, the title of this one is called No One's Fault. It wasn't her fault. She fell running across the open space. Knee bleeding, she wouldn't get picked for the team. None of us understood, of course. We had no word for this. I've read that on earth, our breath is a sowing that we are not our own deliverance, which seemed right after all. What she did was unbutton her cotton dress, facing us unbidden in her white panties, inventing the strangeness of the other in our eyes. Two a.m. I've been told it's the hour of salvation. I wake like a stepped 
on rake. Glaze, but electric is a fence as wind shivers the eaves. Only moments ago, I dreamed faces I once knew, scenes vaguely familiar, a corridor swirling in silver, red, green, like, like ball gowns from a bygone time. Now I'm shed of everything, save my blurry eyes, shallow breath. Now this poem is uh, autobiographical in a way. It's from something that actually happened and it invoked and or inspired this poem. Rural funeral. Organ music swells around us as we sit lucid and still. The bright afternoon festers with August heat. Fields rest blankly. Farmhouses stand isolate and stir a little. Cars scour the gravel road, kick up dust. Somewhere mail is delivered. Somewhere a woman looks over the land she's known and wonders where else she could be. The stunned family gathers in pews near the casket, each and all of us taking what comes, just as the low hills take what comes. The church, its pine appurtenances, the worn carpet, deep red, is thick with us as we sit lucid and still. The young husband of the dead doesn't know what to do with his grief. He bends forward, arms crossed over his body, humming, lost in a song that she sang. Now, April asked me to read this one, so I'm going to. Any of you know where Boise City is? Oklahoma? Some people call it Boise. It's not Boise, it's not Boise in Oklahoma. It's Boise. Boise City. Sunset at Boise City. Two boys out after supper. Shoot the last hoops they can see. As pale light shortens the streets and a man eases into his driveway. Old and young, both wondering if another world exists beyond this, beyond surrounding short grass hills, where they will their where they'll one day find themselves. The dogs turn thrice around before settling down. Boys make the most of the last day's light, and old men are content to let darkness in. have two more. This is one that Tom read from. I also like this one a lot. So It's called A Moral Life. I couldn't help it. Others were clearing brush. Oh, why not join in? There'd be uneven ground, a guardrail to ignore. I got immersed. My balloon went up in a lovely affair. As the sun arcs past its horizon nadir, the cabaret streets hold themselves open where citizens roam blankness. The stranded night evokes, then return home, wondering what the fuss was all about. They are the others in my life, sometimes teachers, sometimes villains. In the end, I get to decide. What did it matter if I stumbled with weed sling in hand? Doesn't the earth demand earthliness? Earthiness? Prayers offered by tarnished hands? Tomorrow I think I'll go back to clearing brush for the sake of those moments where I try to gain and regain possession of myself. This play becomes the work of survival, a kind of moral life. You know, I'm glad uh, William read before because he, um, I could tell. You know, he, oh, I'm sorry, Matthew. William Masters. Yeah, I was thinking, exactly. 
I'm glad he read before because, you know, he about broke down a couple of times in 5 2. So, all right, this is the last one. Saturday night, Blanchard, Oklahoma. Inside the Baptist church, hard on the blacktop highway, men in short sleeves and women in cotton skirts, plain as the soil, sing under yellow bulb light. I can imagine myself standing with them, somewhere between vestibule and their clear-voiced face, faith, though I'm only passing by. The hard packed dirt parking lot, Dodges, Dodges, Fords, having found a temporary space to park their desires. Their alkaline voices hold me, all of them standing, all facing one direction, all singing the words by heart. Standing in that dusky air, I hear my warmest tenor joining, letting the highway of ribbon away. While I sing, I surrender all. A love song to buoy me in this dust. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Um, the little I know of Oklahoma comes from a friend uh, who grew up in a small town called Leedy. And from what I gather, uh, there's a palpable sense of the impulse towards community, which often leads to a very terrible but poignant loneliness. And I think you caught that so beautifully in your poetry. And just one anecdote, my friend's um, pastor was being transferred from Leedy to a even smaller town in a more remote place of Oklahoma called Hooker. And so the church bulletin read, pastor leaves Leedy for Hooker. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so a round of applause for Matthew, April, and Dale. All good. All good. Now so uh, Matthew's book, The Third Renunciation, plus what's the title of your first book, The T? Uh, the Colored Page. The, co the what? Colored Page. The Colored Page. They're both on sale here. And April's uh, Event Boundaries and also your Anxious other, music. other yeah, what is it? Anxious Music. Anxious Music is on sale and is Dale's Midwest Hymns. That's the only one that's here. Okay. So make sure you walk out of here with one if not all three of these books. Once again, thanks to James and thanks to Cade, who's managing the cash register. I want to say one thing. I want to give a round of applause to Cade. This is his last day tonight.